And it is good to see everyone out this evening. I did misspeak this morning when I said how many was here. It was 137 in attendance. I was told I had a preacher's eye and not an actual count. So we'll have, have to really be careful about how I say how many is in attendance from here on out because I'm being watched. This morning in our sermon, we looked at the sins of a nation, and it was taken from my, and we started Micah chapter 2. And he gave an overview of the background of this book and what Micah is preaching about and when it begins. And we looked at some of the sins that compose, that, that a nation can face and the Christians as individual Christians can face. We looked at the sin of omission, which is the failure to act. We looked at the sin of commission, that is willfully committing sin in our life. And then we looked at the sin of homosexuality. And we talked about how this can be detrimental to the nation and how it can open other doors for other types of sin, as we read in Romans chapter 1, a whole host of other sins to enter into our lives, enter into our culture and our society, and overtake it. And as I said this morning, we see that happening. We've been seeing that happen. It's not just in the past five years or ten years. It's been happening for the past 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years and longer. That we've been seeing what people would call major sins entering into our society. And homosexuality has been one of those things that's come along since, I would say, probably the, the late 50s, early 60s, really started creeping into society and was something that wasn't, it was always taboo, but now it's out in the open and it's something that's freely talked about and it's freely put out there. And it's one of those sins that we really need to, as God's children, look at and say, we don't hate the sinner. That's what we need to remind ourselves of when we're looking at lessons like this. We don't hate the people. We hate the sin just like God hates the sin. When we look out, it doesn't matter what the sin is that the person is committing. I don't care if the person is worshiping the devil. When you look at that person, you ought to see a precious soul in the eyes of God and have compassion on that soul that something to be said or done that will bring them back to the Lord and Master before it is eternally too late. All souls are precious to God regardless of the direction they're traveling in this life. Because we need to remember, as we're going to see at the end of the lesson, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, in the last half of the verse, Behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. And we need to remember that. So we talked about, the we ended with homosexuality this morning, talking about how it can open the door to other things. But think about this. Before this whole movement we talked about this morning got started, it was abortion. Bob, and I encourage you, if you want to, say, to, to, to get in more in-depth, and we're going to get in-depth in this this evening, December 19th, 2021, on the church website, you can go and you can look Bob's sermon up. It's abortion in America. It was the morning sermon that, that day. And to listen to that sermon again, it's a really good sermon. What I want us to think about, though, is this. Is the verses listed here, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, Matthew chapter 19, verse 18. Matthew chapter 10, verse 19. Or Mark 10, 19. Luke 18, 20. What do these verses say? These verses talk about murder. Jesus himself saying, thou shalt not murder. That is the killing of another person. Taking of another human being's life. Jesus himself said, don't do it. It's sin. It's sinful to take another life. So many times we get hung up on trying to derive verses to prove that abortion is wrong. I think sometimes we go about it the wrong way. How about we do this? And these are just three verses listed here. How about going back and looking at the verses that validate a baby is a human being? in the womb. How about we start there? Start with, instead of trying to go and browbeat and pounce on people and say, this is murder, 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 murder. This, this is, these are the verses that say that it's wrong to do that. 
Let's go back and lose, use a little bit of reverse psychology, if you will. Validate that that is a living human. Think about the last verse there, Luke chapter 1, verse 41. That's when Elizabeth went in to visit Mary and the baby leapt, leaped in Elizabeth's womb when Mary walked through, when they came in contact with one another. The baby, John, she's buried with John the Baptist. He leaps in his mother's womb. Why? Because, number one, he's a living soul, but he recognized that the king of kings was in his presence, even as an unborn child. We need, to maybe, maybe we need to back up and we need to take a look at some of these things and say, okay, where can we, how can we help to validate this? Let's validate that there's a living being. Let me tell you, there's nothing more incredible than to get to see an ultrasound. And I got to see this about a year ago, and I know we've got, we've got a couple here in the congregation that is expecting here in the next few months, I believe it's in May. The ultrasounds, and we've got new parents, and we see the pictures of the ultrasound, but to get to go into that ultrasound room, and see the picture of this little human, this little person inside their mother's womb, moving and doing somersaults and kicking and times smiling because they have the ability to do that now, to be able to see that. Tell me that's not a living being, living soul. Prove it to me. If it weren't living, it wouldn't be doing somersaults in its mother's womb. It wouldn't be kicking its mother. She wouldn't feel it moving. It wouldn't continue to grow. Yet since the 1970s, Roe v. Wade, we've allowed tens of millions of babies that we know of to be brutally murdered in the United States of America alone. And yes, I take it personal. I take it very personal. I can't imagine my daughter, who's in this auditorium this evening, just turned a year old last month, having chosen to just have her ripped from her mother's womb, cold-blooded murder. Can't imagine it. Yet we as a nation are continuing to allow it. What's the solution to it? How about adoption? You know how many couples there are out there? And I have, have it in my own family that are unable to conceive children, that love to have children. And I'm speaking to those who may be listening online. If you're pregnant and you're considering an abortion, don't do it. Carry the child to term. Put it up for adoption. There are hundreds, thousands of loving families out there that would give anything to adopt that child. Now, I know I jumped ahead there and gave a solution to the problem, but I feel it's necessary because it's such a dark subject. It's a, it's a daunting subject. And so many people are afraid to approach it and to address it. But it needs addressed. We know Solomon tells us in Proverbs 6.17 that God hates hands that shed innocent blood. The blood of the unborn, the blood of innocent children, the blood of those who have committed no crime in this life that are murdered for no reason at all. God despises it. He hates it. Something for us to think about. And the next one here, types of sin that we face as a nation. And I'm not saying, I don't want you to understand this. I put marriage there for a reason. I wanted to catch your attention. And you look at me and go, Jonathan, you're crazy. You're calling marriage a sin. No, I'm not. I'm not calling marriage a sin. I want us to realize and think about this, that marriage as, a, as the generalized thing is, is, was ordained by God in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. When he brought Adam and Eve together, he instituted marriage in the Garden, and it's been like that ever since. One man, one woman for life. Where has it become a sin? It goes all the way back to the days, it goes all the way back to when Moses 
with, because of the hardening of the people's heart, allowed them to give me a writing, a writing of divorcement. Think about this. In our society today, there is such a flippant view of marriage. And I'll tell you who, I, I, the example I'm about ready to use, I'm going to have to credit to Brother Roger Rush from back in, I believe it was 2006, in a sermon I heard him present on the treachery of divorce. He said, it's easier to get a marriage license than it is a driver's license. Think about that. Think about what I just said. It's easier to get a marriage license than it is a driver's license. Yet when we enter into the covenant, to the covenant, to the covenant vows, to the sacred vows and the holy matrimony, and we get married, we marry our spouse, it's till death do we part. And if we, if we break those vows, what can happen to us? It can write us in an eternal demise, of an eternal separation from God. But it's much harder to go out and get a driver's license to, to go up and down I-81 at 90 mile an hour. Now granted, either one of us can kill us. One can kill you physically, one can kill you spiritually. It ought to be harder to get a marriage license. We need to get back to teaching our young people and teaching those around us the sacredness of marriage. To teach them that it, it's something beautiful. And of the majority in here, I'm looking across the, those gathered here, and there's a, I'm saying, when I say the majority here are married. And you realize the blessing it is to have your spouse. You realize the blessing and you realize the, 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 the compatibility goes there, the, the, uh, being there as a help, you know, forget the guys, that your wife there is there as a help me. And they, they, she's there and she, if you're, if you're like me, she makes sure you're dressed right every morning when you get up and you don't look like a clown walking out the door. And that she makes sure you're fed. She helps the, to make sure the house is taken care of, the children are taken care of if you have children. And it's not for us men to be a dictatorship over them, but it's a joint effort going through life. We need to get back to teaching people that it's not a 50-50 thing. It's a 100%, 100%. Because if only you give them 50% of my all, something's wrong. If I'm only be given 50% of my all, then marriage isn't going to work. It's 100%, 100%. And the Hebrew writer says in, uh, in 13, and Hebrews 13, 4, he, he speaks about marriage being honorable and the bed undefiled. That married couple come together as a married couple with their spouse and their spouse only. That's a beautiful thing. That's a very beautiful thing. And that's something we need to think about. We need to, we need to help to reverse the cycle of marriage, divorce, remarriage. That if a young couple gets married and the wife scorches the husband's eggs, that he says, you know what? I'm done. I'm going I'm to write, uh, I, want, I want a divorce. You, you scorch my eggs one, two minutes, you, two days in a row, I'm done. See, and there are people who do that. They do that. No, that's not the reason for it. What was the reason that Jesus gave for a divorce? Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, he said, physical adultery and that alone. And that is only as a last ditch effort. Because if you read your bulletin article today and go back to the sermon, I believe it was it was last Sunday or the Sunday before, on forgiveness. You need to try to work through those problems in a Christ-like manner. And divorce is a last ditch, is the last ditch effort. That's the last thing on the list of things to do when there's problems in a marriage, regardless of what they are. So we talk about all these things. All these sins that a nation faces, that even though Christians are living faithful Christian lives and are being forgiven of their sins, and that we're living righteous lives in this, in this life, that we're living in a, in a nation, and living in a culture, in a society that is sinful. That it's, it's so full of sin that, we, that you can't get away from it. 
You see it on TV, you hear it on the radio, you see it every time you turn your, your smartphone, your tablet, your computer, whatever, you turn it on, if it receives commercials, you're bound to see it. Some type of sin. So how do we do this? How do we correct this? What is the solution to all of this? Well, let me propose this, fulfillment of the Great Commission. How about we do that? How about we go out and we teach those around us the gospel? How about we, how about we start with that? For those who are New Testament Christians, to be able to come back to God, to be able to say, you know what? Instead of saying, are you a Christian? Say, are you in Christ? Opens the door. And I mentioned that on Wednesday evening during the devotional period. I would seriously want us to think about this. Ask a person, instead of saying, are you a Christian? Because automatically they're going to say yes. Because again, that term Christian, again, Tristan was with me that day. That term's been hijacked. Ask someone, are you in Christ? And they'll say, what do you mean? Am I in Christ? It opens the door to say, have you repented of your past sins? Have you confessed Jesus Christ as the Son of the true and living God before others? Have you been buried in the watery grave of baptism? Opens the door up. Because Jesus said, go to all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. Not just who I wanted to go to. Oh, sure, there were times, I'm sure, by human nature, we'd all like to say, well, I just want to cherry pick who I want to take it to. I want to take it to the easiest person there is to talk to out there. I know what he said. I wasn't there, but can you imagine on the day of Pentecost how Peter and the other apostles felt when they were preaching the first gospel sermon? Just think about who was present. It was the same people who had tried and uh, wrongfully tried and wrongfully convicted Jesus Christ of crimes and sins that he did not commit and had him nailed to that tree that they were preaching this sermon to. I can't imagine what they felt like knowing that those individuals were in, in that crowd. They did it anyhow. They fulfilled that command. They preached it. And what happened? They had a huge response. Now think about this. Along with fulfilling the Great Commission, we live faithful Christian lives. Living a faithful Christian life. Titus chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 are just two places to get started in the New Testament. Those are just two passages to get started with. Titus chapter 2 talks about how the older women are to be helping the younger women to learn how to be good wives and mothers and citizens in this life. Also mentions how the older men are to be doing the same for the younger guys. Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 speaks of the home, how the marriage structure ought to be in a biblical sense, in a godly sense, in a righteous sense. And in chapter 6 begins with children obeying their parents. Oh, I believe that's another sermon within itself right there. I see some nodding of heads. It is. Think about that. That's one that was in Romans chapter 1, if memory serves me correctly from this morning. It was being disobedient to parents. It was a sin. It's listed as a sin. I remember growing up, I'd hear those passages be like, well, I'm not being disobedient. I'm just taking a different route from what mom and dad told me to take. Try to, try to squirrel my way out of it. Pleading ignorance, trying to do my own thing. It was wrong. It was wrong. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, it goes on to talk about the armor of God or the Christian armor that we're to wear. Are we wearing it correctly? Are we employing it correctly? Do we know how to wield each piece of that armor in the appropriate manner? Do we know how to utilize it so that it's effective? The older we get, the wiser we get, the better we know how to use each piece of that armor. 
You may be someone who's just been recently baptized and you're learning how to use it. That doesn't mean that you're any less of a Christian than someone who's been a Christian for 80 years and has a lot of wisdom behind them. It doesn't make you any different than them at all. That's the solution. The solution to our problems, all the sins in our nation. It starts with us. Living faithful Christian lives, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ in our local area. If every Christian would do that, and I've got some things that I've been talking with the elders about, and I'm not going to tell you what they are right now because in the future, I think it will work that we may see benefit, great benefits in Berkeley County, West Virginia with them if we can implement them. But I encourage you, don't back away from the opportunity to have a Bible study. And again, Bible studies don't have to be sitting down with an open Bible in a, in a systematic set of questions. Just talking with a person and giving them brief answers at a time can open their heart and lead them to be some of the greatest Christian brothers or sisters we've ever had. So this evening, the question is, where are you at in your Christian? Where are you at in your spiritual walk with God? Are you in Christ? Or are you outside of Christ? In Christ is what your answer needs to be. You need to say, I'm in Christ. I am wearing the Christian armor. I'm covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. I have put him on. I'm living daily. And if you haven't done that, there's a baptistry right behind me, full of water. Garments for you to change into so that you can go home in the dry clothes that you're wearing now so that you don't freeze when you go outside. I promise you won't. And we'll rejoice with the angels in heaven as your name is added to the Lamb's Book of Life, and you begin living faithfully, and you're able to say, I'm a child of the King. And I'm helping to fight the greatest fight there ever was. And I can do that without shedding a drop of physical blood. I can do that by just being a faithful Christian. And that's what it's all about. So if you're here this evening, and you're subject to the invitation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now's the time, now's the place. You have the opportunity. Remember what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, in the last half of that verse. Today is the day of salvation. Now's the time to make it right. Come, while together we stand and sing.